of the participants uh, joining this seminar. Um, my name is uh, Peter McConnick. I'm with the Doughty Water for Food Global Institute, the executive director. And it actually gives me great pleasure. This is a seminar we were due to have uh, a couple of months ago and with everything that's been going on, the, the, it's, it's got delayed, but uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Walia, Harkamal Walia, who um, um, uh, will be giving the seminar. Um, uh, Dr. Walia, uh, in terms of the, the uh, he's a, a, sorry, I've got lost my notes here. He's an associate professor in agronomy and horticulture and also a fellow of, of, of the Water for Food, um, Doughty Water for Food Institute and also associated with the Food for Health Center here on campus. I think specifically for this sem seminar, one of the reasons for this seminar, and the important reason is last year he was made the, the Herman Chair of Agronomy and Doherty Water for Food Institute. Uh, sometimes that doesn't necessarily come through on the communications, but it's basically a chair that was funded to support work across agronomy and, and uh, the, the Doherty Water for Food Institute. I think this is very significant. Some of our recent work around water productivity and increasing production uh, has demonstrated just how crucial are the, the plant breeding, the, the focus of the agronomy is, is in uh, uh, saving water in, in agriculture. Uh, Harkamal is originally from the Punjab. I forgot to ask you earlier, uh, Harkamal, uh, the specific town. I, I know you've told me in the past, but uh, in terms of the Punjab, um, it's one of the world's most important agricultural food systems. Yeah, and really go back to the agricultural systems there. It goes back thousands of years. Um, uh, and it's a very important food, process, uh, food producing part of the world. Really, it's the epicenter of, of the, the green revolution uh, and, and increasing production from four, four and a half decades ago. It's also become one of the challenging areas around groundwater management. So it's certainly, it's, it's very relevant to what the Doughty Water for Food Institute does. Harkamal is also focused, it's also the, the area where major rice and wheat systems, uh, production systems that have evolved and really become the, the heart of India's food producing uh, system, bringing many uh, people in, in, into food security uh, over, again, partly because of the Green Revolution and the history in that part of the world. Arkamal's roots are in those smallholder farming systems in, in, uh, in the rural Punjab. Uh, and, and it's perhaps rather uh, obvious to see that he went into, he did his BS in plant breeding and genetics at the Punjab Agricultural University, and then went on to do his PhD in plant biology at UC Riverside. Um, as I already mentioned, he's an associate professor in the Department of Agronomy and Horticulture. Uh, and he's a very highly accomplished plant molecular physiologist, uh, focusing on genetic improvements for crop uh, resistance and enhancing the, the phenomics knowledge base around these crops. Importantly, he's then been working across disciplines. He's been an active uh, Water for Food uh, fellow for eight years, plus eight plus years before he became the chair and, and then has this more direct linkage with, with the Water for Food Institute. I think as we focus more on better water use and resilience in key crops and livestock systems, the, the emphasis of Harkamal's work, but also being able to work across the, the boundaries. It's interesting, you're also working on the health dimension as well, Harkamal. So I feel this is an exciting seminar for, for us in terms of really uh, establishing uh, Harkamal's linkages into the Water for Food Institute but also in terms of the, the priorities around these, these sort of topics. So I thank you, Harkamal, and, and I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Peter, for this very kind introduction. Uh, I hope my seminar stands to those standards that you laid out. Uh, and you know, I know it's a, it's a unique situation to give a seminar, but uh, I'll try my best. Uh, so I'm gonna try and share my screen here. If somebody could prompt me once they see the, uh, the screen. Okay. Do you see one screen or two? There's two. So I gotta get rid of. Uh... 
Okay, that should do it. Nice to be. All right. Okay. So, uh, so as Peter mentioned, that um, you know, it's, uh, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Agronomy, and it, this happens to be uh, the week when I joined ten years ago, and it also was the week when I first went to the uh, the very first week I was in Lincoln uh, for the for Water for Food conference. Uh, so yeah, so there's several. Uh, you know, at least an important milestone for me to finish 10 years uh, at Nebraska. So today I'm going to talk about um, about wild weeds uh, and you know drought tolerance. So the the topic is uh, wild wheat as a source for enhancing drought adaptation in uh, in wheat. When I say wheat, it's essentially meaning you know pasta or bread wheat. Um, before I sort of uh, launch into my chain of thoughts on uh, what we've been doing in our group, I also want to uh, highlight. Uh, one important person who, you know, I wasn't very aware of this, but, you know, I was made aware of by one of my colleagues, uh, and that's uh, Rosalind Morris. Uh, she was uh, an outstanding, or is an outstanding wheat cytogeneticist. Uh, there's several things that make her, you know, that make me uh, highlight her career. You know, she was uh, born in Wales and moved to Canada and then came to Cornell University in 1947. She was the first woman to get, uh, among the two women in, in that year, to get a PhD in plant breeding from Cornell uh, University. At that point, most plant breeding uh, genetics departments were not uh, admitting uh, women for, uh, for PhD programs. You know, once, when she finished in 1947, she also became the first female faculty in the Department of Agronomy uh, at UNL. And then again, you know, in 1963, American Society of uh, uh, of Agronomy, uh, and she did quite pioneering work on uh, uh, wheat cytogenetics, which basically means uh, you know she was looking at chromosomes before the molecular biology and molecular genetics uh, took roots, uh, and um, and so she, some lots of her work and the, uh, laid the foundation along with some other uh, key researchers or cytogeneticists laid the foundation for what became more. You know, systematically the, the molecular genetics of wheat and wheat improvement. Um, and so the reason I also highlight this is that tomorrow is her, she lives in Lincoln and tomorrow is her 100th birthday. So, uh, and you know, I wanted, uh, there's a couple of links that Rachel would uh, probably share with you that are really great reads uh, for, especially for students uh, and postdocs, you know, who are early in their career. But, you know, she did, uh, the one that I really liked was uh, her, a quote from her that where she says that we do have global warming and the glaciers are melting. Uh, young people need to learn about environmental issues so that they can take leadership roles in deciding on solutions. I think uh, with that, I want to transition to, you know, our present day reality. Uh, which is that our planet is becoming hotter and drier, uh, and that has great implications for on many aspects from human health, you know, human physiology to plant physiology. And uh, when plant physiology gets uh, affected in a uh, in a negative way, it typically results in yield losses and income losses for smaller farmers. Uh, and so, as the you know, the predictions are for. Uh, these extreme events around uh, temperature and water uh, to become more more extreme and more frequent and you know more intense uh, it poses a very big challenge for our society and for our uh, for researchers in general uh, to address this and of course there are many many uh, ways and uh, because of the complexity of the food system itself uh, that you we need to manage and address this challenge from policy to economics to agronomic practices and, and you know, water uh, management and, and so on. Uh, the aspect that my uh, interest is in and my lab works on is to understand how um, temperature, uh, drought, and salinity, so essentially less water and poor quality water, uh, as well as temperature affect uh, the productivity uh, in cereals. So, um, as Peter mentioned, uh, my interest lies in uh, the, you know, understanding the mechanisms involved in how plants respond to 
these stresses as well as if I find, when I find uh, good mechanisms that seem to be working effectively, I try to find the, the genetic basis of it, which means that I try to find the genes that underlie uh, those uh, tolerance mechanisms or physiological tolerance mechanisms uh, with the idea that then those, that information can be used by breeders and geneticists to improve the climate resilience, heat tolerance, drought tolerance of those crops. The crops that I work with uh, are wheat and rice. Uh, rice perhaps is the most, uh, uh, perhaps the most uh, important food crop for global food security. And uh, wheat is the most widely grown crop in the, uh, in, in the world. So when you combine them, the graph on the, on the right side uh, shows the kilocalories uh, uh, that humans get from the, you know, all these different categories. Uh, collectively, rice and wheat provide more than 50% of the entire caloric intake by humans annually. Uh, what's, uh, you know, so, so that's a huge, uh, that's a huge dependency for our food, uh, food security on two species. And, uh, you know, other noteworthy entry is that the third most uh, source of calories is sugar. That tells you about our eating styles, but that's another discussion for another time. Um, the, uh, so, you know, so my focus is on understanding wheat and rice. So today I'm going to talk more about, uh, or entirely about wheat uh, and cereals. The reason is that, uh, you know, given this high dependency on cereals, uh, with wheat, maize, rice, uh, uh, sorghum being some of the major cereals, um, the water is a very important component. Uh, uh, to give you a context of that, this is information I actually got from one of the brochures that you know, Water for Food publishes after their um, their uh, conferences. Um, the uh, okay, I think I have a. Sorry about so you know, water provides or irrigation uh, uh, about twenty percent of the total arable land uh, is uh, is irrigated, but it provides disproportionately high amount of food, which is about forty percent, and uh, that twenty uh, the irrigation uh, about sixty percent of the irrigation goes towards cereal production, and uh, given that you know our freshwater supplies uh, are limited to begin with. And then with these extreme events, the, uh, the supply becomes even more erratic, even though you may, we may have the same amount of precipitation, but the windows in which it's delivered could be very short, so it may result in flooding, whereas uh, you, know, you could also have uh, you know, long, prolonged drought events that last for a long time and, and can severely impact the production of cereals. So with this uh, as the context, you know, I want to dive in on a spe one specific aspect of my work on, uh, on drought tolerance, and that's related to the roots. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, the plants uh, have a hidden half, which is the one that we don't see normally, is it, it's the roots, uh, unless you're looking at potatoes. So the so roots are the, prime, uh, are the site for water uptake, and understanding roots uh, is is quite important in trying to understand these, the mechanisms for tolerance uh, for drought in plants. And so why study roots? So Peter mentioned the, the, the miracle of, uh, of, of green revolution that helped probably save millions of lives by feeding you know, underdeveloped populations in 1960s. And part of the, of the revolution or a significant component of the revol uh, that revolution was the development of the semi-dwarf weeds uh, that were very well suited for optimal conditions. In other, in simple words, if you have a slightly shorter wheat plant, you can put them, pack them together in high intensity, supply irrigated water uh, through you know all the the water management uh, systems, and then uh, supply uh, water and nitrogen, you know, which also started to become available in many parts of the world during that time. And then you have a very high yield, and of course you have more disease and pests, but you have mechanisms to control it. Uh, so this uh, this was all based on the discovery of this RHT, 
gene, which is RHT means re stands for reduced height. Um, and if you look at the picture on the bottom here, uh, you see that as you change specific DNA uh, of, these, of this gene, you get you know, increasing severity in how much the height is reduced. The, the, the general idea was that if, the, if the, the, the spike or the head that bears the seed is not affected, the reduced height is better because you can pack more and when you apply nitrogen, things don't lodge. However, as the agriculture is facing new challenges, primarily from you know, rapid urbanization, resulting in greater demand for uh, water resources as the population increases, so, uh, so agriculture is being pushed to more marginal environments and it's continuing to, it will probably continue to happen, which means that uh, the short root systems in many environments, in many situations can become a limiting factor as we start to look at what the future weeds would look like. So the idea here is that as the, as the shoots become shorter, the roots also proportionally become shorter in many cases. So roots have, uh, so a little bit more about roots. Uh, you know, the roots uh, are highly adaptive. So if you, uh, this is a picture from another uh, faculty member in, uh, uh, in, in the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, and you know these are uh, root maps for the same variety of wheat grown in a dryland environment on the left, uh, and then uh, and the similar variety, uh, the same variety in an irrigated environment. And you can see how the the root architecture, even though the genetics is the same, but the plasticity and the root architecture changes uh, to adapt to the environment where the plant is growing. So m my idea. In pursuing you know this research is to understand what and you know what type of changes or adaptations are useful uh, for drought adaptation or drought tolerance and if we do find some useful mechanisms or adaptation can we uh, uh, find the genes that underlie uh, and with the new tools in genomics we can actually try and attempt to do that uh, with the idea that maybe we can find those specific genes and stack them up in varieties depending on the environment where they're going to grow and then go uh, and then see how what the results look like hopefully a more resilient wheat crop so the the first challenge that you face is when you start working with modern varieties which are shown here on the right is that you go through this bottleneck it's a it's a genetic bottleneck where the idea is that in the, the wild species, before they were domesticated, that, that means you know, before they were picked up by humans and there was a level of selection uh, where humans started picking specific plants that were doing well in their environments uh, or, were, uh, or were de had desirable traits such as bigger seed or most, more tasty seed or more, you know, other features that would help with cooking and storage uh, or agro agronomics. So as they keep selecting, you go from this very rich, diverse uh, set of genes that are very colorful showing here that they are very, very different in their DNA sequence to, to land races, uh, which were the early state, you know, early, you know, humans were using those for several hundred thousands of years uh, to plant breeding, um, the modern plant breeding where you even, you know, narrow down that, uh, uh, that genetic diversity. And then finally, the modern cultivars are very uniform. They don't diverge. They flower at the same time, but they also have a very tight, limited set of uh, uh, genes and gene forms. So you could have new. So the idea is that not only were genes lost, but the variety within a specific gene, which is offered by differences in DNA sequence, is also lost as you continue to select for specific traits. So. One idea is that what if we actually could go back into the wild? We can't go back 10,000 years you know, ago, but we could go back into the wild and look at what the current future of that wild from 10,000 years looks like. And I'll explain that in when I talk about you know, the wheat history a little bit or wheat domestication. So if we could bring the specific, for instance, this purple allele or gene back from the wild and introduce just that rather than the whole you know jar of uh, beans here uh, into and then see what the impact would be on uh, drought adaptation the hypothesis is that things that live in the wild in especially in hot and dry environments 
uh, tend to be more adaptive to the environment. And as our uh, uh, agronomic conditions become more hot and dry, we would want to uh, bring some of those genes back into our elite lines uh, in present day. So uh, wheat's a, a very complex genome. Uh, it was recently sequenced. Uh, the reason it took so long, uh, is perhaps you know, more than a decade, more than rice, is because of its complexity. And that complexity is derived from the idea that within each cell of wheat, uh, you, you have a set of genome, uh, genes called genome, where wheat's derived from uh, multiple gene, genomes. So you have uh, a genome, which is a diploid. It's, uh, humans are also diploid, so for, which implies that we have a, two, you know, a pair of chromosomes for the entire set. Uh, and uh, the, so it was crossed with another diploid to make something called a triticum dicoides, which has two genomes, the B genome and the A genome. But it has, it retained both the genomes instead of having one hybrid genome, it retained both the genomes. And that's, that's called a tetraploid. Uh, and the state of having multiple types of genomes uh, or multiple copies of genome uh, duplicate genome, uh, diploid genome is called polyploidy. So this is a tetraploid. Um, and the, and the, uh, then it crossed again to a diploid genome and it made uh, what is now known as, uh, as bread wheat, the, you know, the, basically the bread that you have. And the tetraploid genome was also domesticated over time uh, to make a triticum durum which is the pasta wheat that we have. So uh, today, what I'm going to focus on is the is the is the uh, is this pasta wheat or triticum durum and its wild relative uh, triticum dicoides, which is also called the wild emmer. It's a it's common name. So the idea that we are going to test is that what we are testing is that we could bring genes and alleles from the wild into the pasta wheat, which is the triticum durum and see how its adaptability improves or decreases uh, uh, in response to water stress. So why use wild emmer wheat? Uh, it has a very, it's already been known for several, almost a century, that it has a rich gene pool for improving drought tolerance, disease resistance, soil tolerance. It has, can, when the environment is right, it can result in massive biomass production and also it has higher grain minerals and protein content. So these are some of the desirable traits. Of course, these traits come with many undesirable traits. That's why you know it's a wild species. So the, there's a couple of pictures that I had a chance to take. Um, they're shown here uh, in the bottom. The dark spike is how small the spike is for, uh, uh, for the wild emmer uh, in that particular environment. Uh, in the background, you would also see a lot of wild oat uh, so uh, it's just growing uh, as a mix. Uh, the site uh, for the wild emmer uh, uh, is um, that we uh, that my collaborator in Israel collected is called the Zabitan. So it's a stream that flows into the Sea of Galilee. I show that as a highlight. Um, and uh, you know the the wild emmer wheat was originated in the northeastern Israel and the Golan. And then it was dispersed into the Near East Fertile Crescent. So uh, most of the cereals were originating in the Fertile Crescent. So this is part of that uh, uh, evolution. And so the accession, a single plant that was collected uh, by my colleague uh, was named Zabitan after that stream that flows into the, uh, the Sea of Galilee. And uh, it has very large seed size and it also makes very large plants when the conditions are good. Uh, so this is uh, me at the site in, in 2017. Uh, on the right is my colleague uh, from Hebrew University, uh, uh, Dr. Zvika Pelek. And on the top picture, you could see the the always almost always in news Golan Heights. That those mountains on the top or the flat hills on the top are the Golan Heights. And you also could see the Sea of Galilee in the background. Uh, so it wasn't a very clear day when I took this picture. Uh, but uh, so just to give you an idea, also to give you an idea is that some of these weeds, when you bring them into a greenhouse condition with very, uh, you know, good irrigation, they can actually grow taller than, uh, you know, in this case, my colleague. 
So what was so special about the Zavitan accession is that the, the a, a very large consortium of uh, wheat genomicists decided to uh, sequence this genome uh, along with you know already available wheat genomes, uh, including the pasta wheat uh, the pasta wheat genome uh, that I will also talk about. Uh, so this was uh, published a few years ago. That sort of really set up and in in science and it was really set up for the study that I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to go through some genetics because I know there's some geneticists, uh, but I will try to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, so essentially what my collaborator did a few years ago, he took the uh, elite uh, pasta wheat from Europe called Svevo, uh, and he crossed it to this wild wheat, Zavitan, and he made these hybrids, which were then went through a series of genetic uh, processes to create a, a dispersed set of lines that we expect to be very different, but still similar to the parents, but very different uh, depending on how the DNA ex exchange between these two um, parents through recombination. Um, and then he grew them in, uh, in, uh, in control conditions as well as in drought conditions, and he selected a set of lines uh, that were more similar to Swevo, the elite line that farmers grow um, called Swevo, uh, and then he selected it to, for three generations to generate these lines called uh, nearly uh, near isogenic lines, which were then further characterized. So Suevo, Zavitan, I've told you the story of Zavitan. The Suevo story is actually simpler. Uh, if you've had Barilla pasta from any of the grocery stores locally, uh, you're essentially eating Suevo. Uh, most of their uh, pasta uh, is made out of Suevo, this elite line. Um, um, for this brand. So this is what the, uh, the seeds look like. On the left, you have the, the wild wheat Zavitan, and on the right, you have the more uh, distinct wheat-like wheat -like looking uh, Durham wheat. Uh, so you know, he also worked with different genetic populations, but in the end, uh, to summarize and also to kind of uh, you know, quickly get to the point is that he had a set of about 40 to 50 lines that looked very similar to Suevo in terms of its flowering time, and you know uh, that resulted in uh, being selected for further characterization. So, uh, so essentially, what he made was um, introgression lines. Uh, these introgression lines uh, are shown here. I I know it's a very complex graph, but what I really want to emphasize here is on the uh, there are there are one a one b to seven a and seven b are the fourteen chromosomes uh, uh, of uh, of this tetraploid wheat lines uh, and we use genetic markers essentially uh, uh, essentially the uh, we're using genetic markers to uh, to figure out which part of the the genome contains the the blue part which is the part from the wild wheat and which part contains the, the, the Swebo part. So the idea is to have largely red genome, but with small pieces of blue genome from the wild so that we can systematically test uh, the, where the genes might be if we do discover something interesting. So, on the, so with this idea and this set of lines, we, uh, uh, that's where you know, UNL came into play because uh, uh, Zwick Palek sent his uh, fresh PhD student, uh, shown here on the top right, Harel Basher, uh, to Nebraska uh, with the idea uh, that he would take these lines and he would use the, uh, the image-based phenotyping system uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the Innovation Center, uh, the greenhouse facility, and characterize these lines at a resolution and with the technology that's not commonly available in many parts of the world. So there's an experimenter design for, uh, for his plants. He grows them, uh, takes the healthy looking plants, and then he has two sets of plants. One is the uh, well-watered plants, which are kept around 80% field capacity, and the others, he lets them dry down to the point where uh, about 70% of, uh, of the water from the pot is lost, and then the water gets aut aut uh, added automatically after being weighed, so, you know, the second parallel set of these uh, in, uh, introgression lines were maintained at 30% field capacity. 
And these plants were imaged uh, daily with multiple cameras, uh, including the RGB camera, which is the one that you have on the phone, uh, fluorescence camera and hyperspectral. So today I would uh, mostly be, talk, uh, be talking about the RGB camera data. So how is it useful? Uh, when we take images uh, of the above ground part to the shoot of the plant, we can you count the pixels using software and then match it with the fresh weight by harvesting these plants and the dry weight as well as the shoot area. And in all three cases, we found that our images uh, or the total pixel count, which we uh, in our field in phenomics, we use the term projected shoot area or PSA, which I would use quite frequently from this point onward, uh, to match has a very high correlation with the fresh weight and the shoot dry weight and shoot area. So the other uh, phenotypes that we collected uh, uh, from, this, um, uh, from these images was the height, the width, so how high the plant is, how wide it is, that gives you an indication of the sideways growth. Uh, the convex area, which is shown here with this blue uh, you know, area, so the, the, the blue line that cover, sort of goes around and outlines the plant's features. Uh, water use because these plants are weighed, pots are weighed every day and then uh, the amount of water is decided whether it needs to be watered to a certain level or not watered. Uh, and then we also calculate water use efficiency or WUE, uh, which, show, which is essentially an idea that amount of pixels gained every day to the water used every day. So basically how much of the water is going adding towards the shoot biomass. Uh, we also used a, a susceptibility index, uh, which is essentially derived from there. So if, if the higher the index, uh, more sensitive your, uh, the plant is or that accession is to water stress. Uh, so this is an, an example of what the plants look like. Uh, Suevo, which is the elite line, is on the left, uh, highlighted with the blue bar. And then you had a set of uh, introgression lines. And you can see even under well water conditions, there's many different types and how their response changes if you limit the water in the bottom panel. Uh, so these are plants at the end of the, uh, end of the experiment. So the plants were imaged for about 35 days. And, uh, and this is kind of what the, that the collective information for all the interventions look like. So the blue bar is the well water, which shows the projected shoot area, and the red bar is the averaged water limited values for all the interrogation lines. And the gray bar uh, in both cases uh, is, it represents the suevo. So it tells you that uh, the water treatment that we applied uh, was uh, for, you know, the water treatment that we applied, it has uh, an impact on the shoot biomass or projected shoot area. So there was a, a reasonably strong water stress. Uh, so this is what we did next. Uh, so Harel uh, basically, took all these values for the parameters that I showed you, which are on the left side, and he made a heat map. So he clustered different introgression lines, and he um, asked, how do, is there any pattern to it? So what we found was that there were five clusters. The cluster, uh, we can start from the cluster on the, on the, on the, on the right, and green, uh, the, the red here represents higher values, and blue here represent lower. The higher the value, more intense is the red. And um, the, uh, so the cluster one, which is the red cluster, is the one where the, the, uh, the elite parent went to. And you can see that for most of the characteristics, it's, uh, you know, it is blue, uh, the traits, uh, under water limited conditions. Uh, so we sort of label this as more of a drought susceptible set of plants uh, or lines. And then we had a set of lines that were uh, also quite blue but they were also remarkably small uh, in their size. So they're definitely not the kind that you would want uh, you know, as a desirable trait. Uh, and then there were other, another set, which was the blue, which had, was moderately susceptible in the sense that it was better than the two other clusters. And then we had a set uh, of lines that was highly plastic. Here, plasticity implies that there's, they were big, for instance, in response to uh, in normal condition, but they changed quite dramatically in response to water stress. And then on the very left side was uh, the cluster in black, which was labeled as highly stable because they did not show as much for the traits that we measured. They did not show 
uh, as much of a, uh, of a change in response to water stress. So they were stable or tolerant. Uh, and so we focused on these two uh, clusters, or at least uh, you know that that seemed like the most uh, the first place to go, because they both had very high biomass, and they also had higher water use efficiency. That's kind of indicated here. Uh, in, in this case, you have very high biomass here, and then you have very high water use efficiency in several of the lines in the orange cluster. So we what we did next was uh, you know, Rel picked three lines that were represented from these two clusters uh, and the and the the parental line which was labeled as more drought susceptible uh, and he pl plotted their individual uh, shoot biomass accumulation over time uh, of dark blue here representing well water and light blue water limited and what was evident is that the you know the swevo uh, swevo had a uh, the biomass doesn't increase as much, but this uh, nil uh, line 20-2 had very high biomass uh, in the well water. However, it also had a very big drop when in response to water limited conditions. So we'd label that as highly plastic. And then we had two highly stable lines that had higher biomass uh, than Swebo. So it's 46-3 and 90-1, but they also didn't show uh, uh, as much of a change. So they were more stable or tolerant, whereas 20 2 was highly plastic. So this kind of formed the, 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 the set that we focused on initially for uh, trying to narrow down the mechanism because they provide us a very contrasting response to uh, compared to their parental line underwater stress. We also looked at the assimilation rate. You know, this is typically a physiological uh, parameter that you know, we measure at whole plant level. So that we so primarily to confirm the idea that uh, you know these lines do show plasticity in terms of the amount of carbon they are fixing. You know, the carbon that fix gets fixed is the primary driver of uh, of biomass accumulation. So uh, so you know, images are nice, but you know old style physiology is still relevant. And it, it, you know, this, in this case, it confirmed what we were seeing with the images. Um, so when we, uh, one of the things that Rel did at the end of the experiment, you know, these are the plants at the end of the experiment, uh, he looked at the roots. Roots are complicated. Uh, I convinced him to, he was very excited about the images, but I asked, convinced him to do some washing. So he spent a fair bit of time washing, you know, several hundred pots. Uh, out, out of soil, which is not that easy and probably has lots of other issues. Uh, but what we found was that the under well watered condition and water limited conditions, Swevo does have, you know, it sort of changes its root architecture, but uh, these nil 20-2 had a very remarkable phenotype. Under well watered conditions, when it was making a lot of biomass, as you can see here, uh, under water limited condition, it dropped down quite dramatically. So that's why we picked it because it was very plastic or responsive. But if you look at the, the root uh, biomass, it just transitioned very dramatically from putting its carbon under well water condition into the shoe to, the, to building up on roots. So it, it essentially was mining the water in the, inside the pot. As of course, you know, it has all kinds of limitations compared to field site. But it was quite dramatic change for us. So it's this change in root to shoot ratio. Uh, we also saw some changes, but not as dramatic in the in the in the stable lines. You know that just reflects that they were stable, generally speaking, uh, both for roots and shoots uh, under both conditions. Um, we then you know roots are complicated, uh, and you can test them in different environments uh, since it's harder to do it in in the soil, you know, field soil with pots. Uh, so we, Harel designed another experiment and used another setup that's commonly used in my group, where we have these pipes with sand, so you could actually pull out the roots and look at their length and so on quite well. So when he does, did that for the NIL 20-2, uh, you know, and he compared it to Swevo, which is on the left side, so you have this well-watered set of plants here, uh, you know, from Swevo and NIL 20-2, and then you have this Swebo again and 20 2. He found that in both cases, you know, the, uh, there was reduction uh, in root length, uh, but the, the reduction in root length in, uh, 
in the in 20-2 was much less and uh, that when he looked at the root to shoot ratio he also observed that the uh, that the male which is again here in darker uh, darker blue uh, is not as affected uh, so it maintains that whereas the root to shoot ratio drop in this experimental setup at this stage dropped quite a bit in uh, in, uh, in in Swevo, the elite line. Um, so the next thing uh, we did was we lo he looked at it in uh, in seedling stage, and the reason to do that was because if we pull out roots from uh, soil or sand, we typically damage them. And if we wanted to look at what the genes might be involved in uh, or are differently ex uh, expressed or activated or suppressed in these plants, uh, it would be quite a challenge because you are looking not only at the drought response and the difference in genetics, but you're also looking at how the roots are responding to pull, being pulled out. So you know, it, it's a lot more stressful for roots uh, and not a very viable mechanism for understanding molecular processes involved in, in, uh, in this case, you know, the root growth. So we use these seedlings and we confirmed that the, and these are done in paper rolls, so they're not as aggressively pulled out. Um, uh, and we confirmed that the roots are still longer, even in very early stages. So we pull out the roots and we work with uh, Shi Zhang's group in, uh, in School of Biological Sciences. And they helped us combine both the genomes, the wheat genome and the Swevo genome, and use the genotypic information to identify uh, several genes that are differentially expressed. So DEG stands for differentially expressed genes. So he found about 535 genes, and about 40 of those genes map to the regions based on DNA marker where we know that the, the, the DNA has been exchanged between the wild wheat and the, and the pasta wheat. So based on this, we uh, selected to, uh, we really like this area from, uh, on chromosome 2A, so A genome and chromosomes 2. Uh, where we have uh, you know three genes that are significantly changing in expression, and uh, what we have so far is that the um, uh, you know the, we have identified a gene which is uh, looks like a, a receptor of some type, so it's a serine threonine protein kinase. Kinases are involved in many in many times they are involved in sensing. So our idea is that the this gene which in wheat is only expressed in it's you know it's more expressed in the wild type the wild wheat and in the nil 20-2 which has that piece from wild wheat uh, and this gene is only expressed in the roots and we also know that the kind of since as i mentioned are involved in sensing we think that the the 20-2 nil uses up a lot of the water and when there is a water limitation because it's using a lot more water it, from the pot, it senses that water limitation earlier, and then it can adapt perhaps more quickly. So we think that there's a you know there's more data that we're still working through, but I, the sense at the at least the current hypothesis is that this twenty two is sensing water early, and then it has a a window of opportunity perhaps. So there's other genes we don't know that for sure uh, that enable it to continue to grow. Uh, below ground, but not as much above ground. So that partitioning of carbon, where it, whether it flows to the leaves or the roots, is regulated uh, better by by this particular uh, nail. Uh, we, of course, you know we have we have several steps. Part of the collaboration is that we do the things in the greenhouse in Nebraska, and then they test these lines out in uh, in Israel, which was happening very well until they were told to shut down. So essentially, they could not harvest it because of the pandemic. But we did uh, Haral did an experiment in the greenhouse uh, with these ground beds and you know water sensors and so on. So uh, so to summarize the results from it, he took images and he also took photosynthetic measurements again in a setting which is more close to the field setting with the density uh, and he finds that the you know the the nil 20-2 has a similar trajectory shown here on the bottom left uh, right uh, uh, for photosynthetic assimilation which is the rate of uh, assimilation uh, to Swevo which was very similar to what was published by my collaborator several years ago that did uh, the same study and shows for Zavitan, the wild wheat itself, 
and this in this case you know of course 20 dash 2 has only three pieces from the wild wheat that we could detect in the parental lines label so uh, we also looked at the you know other phenotypic data of course you know this is uh, in the greenhouse in a ground bed so there's several limitations but we did find that the the nil does have more early vigor shown here um, with the blue curve and uh, but it flowers later under well water conditions however when we limit the water stress uh, or limit the water so there's a, a prolonged uh, water stress we don't see as much of a of a difference in the growth uh, at least not significant but what we did see was that the when we looked at the spikes you know the the even though the grains kind of not that different and it's a very small set of plants to actually talk about grain yield in general but we did find that the spike length the length of the organ of the plant of the flower which bears the grain is uh, it's quite high in uh, in both well water and uh, water limited conditions in swevo or in 20-2 compared to swevo so in this case the you know the graph plots on the uh, on the 20-2 on the left side and swevo's on the right so what that helped us prompt back is that we, we we were prompted so we go went back and we started looking at the, the spike morphology of all the introgression lines the entire set of uh, 40 some lines that we were characterizing and this just shows you high, how diverse the you know just a cross between a wild and a, an elite line can create such kind of diversity in the spike morphology of course, you know it, it, this encompasses different colors, pigments, but also you know more intuitively grain density, grain size, length, weight, grain weight. So all of those are and spike length, of course. So there's a lot of diversity here, which you know it's easy to to quantitatively say they are different, but to quantify it's actually quite challenging. So we we're working with uh, Hong Feng Yu's group in computer science, uh, where we're developing new phenomics methodologies. Uh, um, so to use cameras and many many images uh, to do 3D reconstruction and then actually der derive these digital traits that we can then use for further characterization at genetic level. So so this work is ongoing and I think we have a much better system now to work with uh, uh, than the one that they were using to test in the computer science lab. But it was actually refreshing to see you know wheat plants circling around and in a computer science lab in general so uh, so with that i want to conclude that you know the uh, the idea that we're pursuing uh, you know in terms of methodology here is that the you know the imaging can provide you a sense of temporal scale which is hard to get when you're just looking at final harvest and yields and that the 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 potential for not only wild emmer but for wild species in general to bring related wild species to bring into species which have the tendency or the, the capacity to tolerate these introductions from why such which wheat has because of its polyploidy uh, could not only contribute to the uh, drought tolerance and enhanced root plasticity as seen with the 20-2 but many many other traits uh, our ultimate hope is that we could uh, use our genetic tools genomics tools that have been become available and our transcriptomics to uh, identify novel genes and create that knowledge base that can then be used by breeders and geneticists for improving uh, you know drought tolerance and other traits that would make crops more resilient to you know what the world looks like to be more warmer and drier and you know of course you know, these traits of interest would vary from one group to the other uh, i want to thank the people who were involved uh, from unl uh, the the lion's share of this work was done by harel basher uh, who's now back in hebrew university uh, but he spent about two years in my lab uh, and collaborator like V. Peleg, who you know generated all the resources and I learned a lot along the way about wild uh, species and domestication. Um, uh, Asaf Slepfel uh, also helped with the uh, uh, with the genomics resources and we are the genetics. We are also being helped by Gota Morota uh, from Virginia Tech. Uh, the funding for this research and you know, many of the resources comes from UNSF and INR as well as Water for Food. So many thanks to for that. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to do the escape mode. And um, if you have any questions.
Thank you, Harkamal. Thanks so much for that presentation. Um, this is where we would have all uh, been clapping and then we would have taken questions in the seminar room, but we work with what we have on Zoom and we're grateful that we have um, 33 participants joining us this morning. Um, my name is Jesse Starita. I'm the public relations and engagement coordinator with the Nebraska Water Center. And I just wanted to quickly say before um, opening it up to Q&A, I've known Harkamal since about the time that he uh, started at UNL, maybe a few years after. And it's, it's been great, Harkamal, to see all the uh, progress in your work and in your research and, and professional development, including this most recent uh, chair that you've got. So again, thank you, Jesse. Congratulations. So uh, great. It looks like we've got a question. There's a lot of people on here who know a lot um, about these topics. So I'm just going to start. And um, Dr. Uh, Suat Irmak has a, a question. Um, I'll try to get through all of this. It's a bit lengthy, but he says, uh, hi, Harkamal. I apologize for the long question. I enjoyed the presentation. Uh, as you know, in human history, the first known organized communities who also invented agriculture lived in southeastern Anatolia, modern Turkey. Uh, they have domesticated wild wheat in 10,000 BC for household use. Um, it is also the birthplace of wheat. I read about their domestication technique they used 10,000 years ago, which is mind boggling. The area has a hyper dry climate and I personally visited the site and saw the wild wheat still growing there with good yield with extremely limited water and no nitrogen under extreme heat. Many scientists from all over the world visit the site to collect wild wheat samples for breeding research. Uh, we could travel there together to gather some data when COVID-19 goes away, as I have interest in wild wheat root growth, transpiration, productivity, uh, phenology and physiology response to water. So maybe a, a comment off of that, Harkamal? Yeah, uh, Suat, that's a really, yeah, that would be amazing. It would have been amazing without, you know, as my, you know, very young kids are starting to say, like they never say COVID anymore. They always say when the stupid COVID goes away. <laughs> so, you know, yes, it would have been an amazing idea, uh, you know, then and i think given that you know uh, it would mean that you know things have returned to normal if you and i are traveling and i know we've traveled for water for food with other colleagues from water for food to india and we had a i would really love it and i think there would be so much to learn from the historical perspective and um, and, and from the physiology and genetics and just you know the uh, you know, the the hospitality you know and food and culture that turkey brings it, the culture is just as old as, you know, as Swat mentioned, human history. Only when we domesticated these crops could we actually have the time from gathering and hunting to do other things that make human and our civil, humans and our civilization so special. Us so special compared to many other species. So thank you, Swat. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I would encourage if you've not read the chat, like the the you know Swat brings a good perspective, historical perspective on uh, on wheat and how it's entwined its history and its how it's entwined with human history yeah, in the Fertile Crescent. Yes, thanks, thanks, Swat, for that question. Uh, I'm going to try this. Uh, Francisco has been has asked to. Uh, talk. So let me unmute him. And Francisco, are you with us? Yes, I am. Uh, can you hear me? Hi, Francisco. We can. Hi, Kamal. Fantastic talk. I, I was really fun to follow and really enlightening uh, the way that you put together all these complex and diverse concepts about the about wheat. Thank you. Would like uh, to go back to to the slide that was probably the most fascinated, fascinating for me, which is the narrow genetic diversity in crops. Yeah, I'll, I'll go get there and I'll share the screen so I could, uh, yes. Um, I should do this here, share screen first so I can actually see the screen. Sounds good. Uh, this, share. 
And then I do this. Yes. Can you see it? Yeah, I see it. So the, the question is because as in the case of wheat, we also can talk about corn and we can talk about soybean and many, many other crops. And for me, it seems like the industrial revolution, the green revolution brought in all these perspectives and the possibility to manipulate or to control basically the plants, right? But in the process you mentioned, we lost this ability of the plan to adapt. And was an ability that was formed, engineered, or created as the cultures evolve, as Sue had just mentioned, and we can talk about the case of the corn back in Mexico. Yeah. So the, the question is more in terms of the big picture. Are we trying to get back to the old times, when we see, we see the old times were always good, to the old times where we have these abilities to adapt? And yeah. the, is the case of the wheat as many other crops, do we have that ability to come back? Or have we lost that diversity? And now we need to recreate and basically a reinvest resources now in what we remove from uh, the old from the legacy of the old cultures so uh so that's a good complex question and a discussion point i think francisco the uh, uh so the ability is essentially genes that could have been lost right and then it also could be that you know genes have different shades so uh, you know, a gene can have as many shades as many, you know, nucleotides it has. So the sequence, right? You could change that. Um, so the so both of them could have been lost because we when we select we select let's say for uh, early flowering, right? We don't want the the wheat or the corn plant to keep growing for a very long time, and when it gets really hot, it starts to flower, and then the pollen dies, and we don't get seeds, or there's some other seed abnormality, right? So in that case, let's, that's an instance. Uh, what we uh, so you would select for early flowering, but the way it works is that you know genes are next to each other. When you select for one type of gene, you may actually lose you know other types because you're selecting based only on that, and that's how you know some of that loss occurs. So now the question is, can we go back to the wild? So remember the wild that was then 10,000 years ago is not the wild that we have now because the wild is also adapting to the environment and it's also being, you know, going through this, uh, you know, not only just objective, but like just random events that are breaking genes and, you know, making new forms of genes. So we, in many cases, that uh, the pool's not as large as you could find in other cases. So it really varies uh, from you know the type of research, the effort that's gone in, and how much of the uh, of the you know the the original center of diversity is being changed. For instance, in my most recent trip to Israel, when we were looking at these uh, wild weeds, uh, as opposed to the Golan Heights site, there were wild weeds in other parts of Israel where. The, you know, you had higher, I could see high rises being constructed, maybe a kilometer away, like, you know, a mile, mile and a half. So, you know, so essentially those buildings are going to come in and take these sites away because these, all these wild plants are different. Each one could actually be different from the next one. Uh, the, once you have, once you build on that site, you lost it. So there's many instances where you would have actually lost this genetic diversity. So it's very low. Uh, and it's hard to find, uh, but in other cases, it's still there. So, you know, uh, we're losing it with urbanization and other changes in climate because, you know, some of these lines may not be able to survive when it gets even hotter or warmer or drier or, you know, other diseases and pests start to invade, which normally would not be in that region. So, uh, so that's that. But in terms of, uh, if you go and talk about maize, you know, we have gained a lot too. You know, maize, as you know, is, you know, uh, is from Central America, Mexico, so they have you know, it's a tropical environment. But we're growing here in Nebraska, which is clearly temperate, and uh, you know, so there's things that we've lost. Uh, so in, when you talk about this green revolution, 
the higher density that we can grow maize is you know based on this ability to keep the leaves top leaves folded up upwards so more light can come in and you can still plant at higher density um, whereas when the indians were growing maize you know they were growing them on uh, you know uh, on hilltops because we flattened out a lot of that in in the midwest so in that case you had a, you needed a different type of leaf angle for the sunlight to come in uh, and you know so that more radiation can be captured you know i'm it's not my area but I'm, i know that you know the two people that for maize would be great to talk to would be uh, uh, jim schnabel and tom hogemeyer a former uh, faculty who still is engaged uh, with many aspects of the university so those would be the um, i've learned a lot from tom about you know maize history and then going to the seminars uh, but yeah you're right there's uh, there is the ability to capture some of these resources if those resources are still there or those locations are if you if we built a city where you, there used to be a center of diversity you know the, the probability is very low thanks karkamal good thanks francisco um let's do at least one more question because this person's been waiting for a few minutes this is a great question i think um Thank you for the presentation. What is the conservation status in the wild of the wild emmer, both in situ and ex situ? Uh, I know that there's many collections in individual universities. Um, there is, of course, you know, there's you know seed banks where you, people also send seeds, um, but I I don't know for sure. You know. Uh, I know that uh, the, my colleague and some of his uh, colleagues in that department go out. You know, in fact, the first tour that I went to, uh, I went with a, I forget the professor's name. He's he's retired. He's he was 85, and he could climb those hills and find them. Like you know, he he's been doing that for several decades. You know, he was he knew exactly. Where you got to park the car, and then you know which hill to climb, and what time of the year to go there. So yeah, there's, so there's a lot of knowledge there that's probably not recorded, but germplasm. You know, I'm I'm sure there's uh, you know many visits to uh, you know, many visits to Turkey that researchers have made. You know, Lebanon, Syria, but you know those are also not the you know there's a political dynamics there that's very difficult to. It doesn't look like it's going to be easy to get there, you know. Uh, so yeah, so I'm trying to kind of, do, you know, answer a question for which I don't know the exact answer, but you know, those are my thoughts. Thanks, Harkamal. Uh, let's make this the the last question, just so we can stay close to our schedule. This I, I thought W. Don might get a question in, and sure enough, he asks, "Do your findings in regard to root structures?" cause you to conclude that the next step in grains research should be to explore perennials i think there's a place for perennials especially you know if we are being pushed into uh, very marginal lands and there are you know we are losing arable land quite at a very high rate you know i don't have the numbers off the top of my head but i think uh, the perennial would definitely have a role to play because of the way you know the soils maintain and the 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 carbon footprint is decreased. So we need to start thinking about those things at a broader level. The type of things that you know typically I would not think about. So, uh, but that's uh, definitely it. Doesn't uh, that definitely needs to be part of the mainstream research thought? You know, and and also I feel like the uh, from what I've read, you know. Almost 95% of what we eat comes from just 30 species. You know, given that there's you know hundreds and hundreds and you know thousands of species of plants, and many of them are edible. Uh, you know, it's a very limited set of species. So the more we can add to uh, the the biodiversity of our agro ecosystems, uh, the stronger and more resilient it would be. Because you know, resilience alone is not going to come from one making one crop tolerant or 10 crops tolerant you know the, we we're going into the future when we haven't seen as a civilization for you know for a long time so uh, so how the more diversity we have the greater would be our the probability that we would be more sustainable 
in terms of food production and uh, you know keeping poverty and hunger away so yeah that's it thank you for bringing that up Well, with that, I wanted to thank everyone for their participation, their questions. Um, and just to remind folks that we sent out a few links in the chat uh, box. There uh, was a link to Harkamal's uh, faculty page. Also some more information about uh, Dr. Rosalind, who he referenced at the beginning of the talk, uh, an inspiring figure that I had not heard of previously. And then uh, Rachel just shared uh, another link as well, and I'm gonna to add to this uh, pile up by sharing the YouTube link for the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute. Um, once this Zoom recording is processed and uh, ready to go, we will um, add that to our YouTube channel so you can catch it that way as well. Um, Peter or Rachel, would you like to jump in? Any kind of concluding remarks? Yeah, certainly, Jesse, and thank you for uh, such a great job of uh, moderating this. Um, Harkamal, uh, I think you easily lived up to expectations. The comments, there's a lot of uh, very positive comments on the side, and, and I really enjoyed it. Um, thank you. I think, uh, one of the, it's a little overdue, so I'm, I'm very pleased to see that. I, I also appreciate all the, the good questions we've been having from faculty members and elsewhere. It's good to see that the interest and the cross disciplinary interactions. I, I think we, we need to be doing other kinds of this, this seminar, certainly in, in, in during the lockdown. And I, I look forward to hearing your, your and Swat's report from, from, uh, from Turkey when you go and visit the, yeah. the sites there. Yeah, that'd be one, one good day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, that's great, fabulous. Thank you everyone for joining uh, you know, the seminar and for the questions. Thanks.